Ah, friends, welcome to Being Human with Steve Cuss, fellow human. Now, the simple idea of this podcast is that it's hard to be human-sized for very long. We all tend to get bigger or smaller. We get filled with reactivity. And this is a podcast to help us to become human-sized so we can be more connected, connected with ourselves so we know what's going on in us and we know when we're infected and when we're infecting others. Connected, of course, with our loved ones, our friends and family, uh, because we're gospel people. Also connected with difficult people. We did a whole episode on how to survive politics and stay connected. And uh, what's been most life-changing to me, uh, connected to an awareness of God. Now, what's true about me is I go through long periods of time where I'm not overtly aware of God. So I'm trying to use my reactivity as a way to notice when I'm no longer aware of God. And then I'm trying to cultivate habits every day where I can kind of stub my toe on the love of God. And one of my favorite simple habits is lighting a candle. Every time we're on this podcast, we just pause and we light a candle, whether you're joining on audio or video. And we do it by faith so that we can relax into the presence of God. This candle today is an amber bergamot candle. I know bergamot is really controversial, particularly when it comes to tea. There are two kinds of people, those who love Earl Grey, that's me, and then those who can't stand Earl Grey because they think it tastes like dish soap. All right, so this is an amber bergamot candle. I simply light it by faith. Just by faith that God is as close to me as this, um, this light that I'm looking at. I light it by faith, remembering what John said, that God is light and in God there is no darkness at all. And I do it just to intentionally pay attention to my reactivity, pay attention to my breathing, and be mindful that God is good. Okay, last episode we were laying some foundation, and this is another foundational episode. I wanted to do six or eight episodes, uh, about half of them just me, and then my wife Lisa will join us for a couple uh, of these early episodes. She's a attachment therapist, a trauma therapist. She does parts of self, and so Lisa brings these amazing ways in for us to practice our reactivity and connection. And then I'll be bringing in uh, my coworker Jimmy Carnes. Uh, Jimmy and I have worked for over ten years together, and uh, he is a specialist in reactivity. But he'll also be bringing some thoughts on the Enneagram. So these early six or eight episodes, they're really foundational to let us then continue what will be a, a long run here when we bring on guests and things like that. So where I left off last time was I started inviting us to look at our core beliefs versus our precious belief. It was the simple idea and in some ways a troubling idea that even though Jesus is most precious to me, Jesus may not automatically be my core deepest belief. When I'm under pressure, when I'm feeling stress, when I'm feeling attacked, when a lot of reactivity is coming at me, or I notice there's a lot of reactivity in me, I tend to revert back to these different sets of beliefs. These are core beliefs that, that operate my life, that kind of drive my life. So it becomes quite a contrast between when I'm relaxing into God's presence and when I'm actually living out of a false belief. So you remember from last episode, I was saying that all reactivity is generated by false belief, false need, uh, assumption, things like that. So we're actually going to dive in today to the nature of every belief. But before we do, I thought it might be fun, particularly for those of you who are newer to my show and my own work, it might be fun just to nerd out for 10 or 15 minutes on systems theory. I've hinted at this a couple of times and I always wrestle with this because I find system series so fascinating. It's one of those theories, it's been around now for about 70-ish years. Yeah, 65, 70 years. And yet, weirdly, it's still largely unknown. It really hasn't broken into kind of main culture. Uh, most therapists have been trained in some form of systems theory. But even when I do my workshops and I run into therapists, there's a lot of them that will come up after a workshop and they'll say, oh, I remember something about that in class, like even, even then. So I want to teach us a bit of history of systems theory because I find it might be just helpful to get that theory talked about in this episode and then we don't have to nerd out as much. We can bounce off the foundation of it. So 
System theory, as it relates to family system theory, was started by a man named Murray Bowen in the 1950s. Bowen was a psychiatrist and he specialized in um, teenage onset paranoid schizophrenic patients. He ran a lockdown psych ward. Uh, I think it was either in Maryland or DC. He was always around the Washington DC area. You can imagine a psych ward in the late 50s and what a challenge that would be. What's interesting about Bowen is in the fan, in the field of psychology, he's kind of in the big three psychologists. You've got obviously Sigmund Freud, you've got Carl Jung, and then a lot of people would say Murray Bowen, not because he's the most famous, but because in the 50s he shifted the emphasis of psychology. What he did is he first was treating schizophrenics as if all of the pathology was inside them. But then he would start to observe family visitation day in the psych ward, like every, for example, every Sunday afternoon when mum and dad could come and visit their teenage or their young adult uh, child who is now in a psych lockdown. And Bowen was paying attention to the way mum or dad or mum and dad together would relate to this adult child. And it was an epiphany for him. This is kind of obvious now, but back then it was pretty wild where Bowen said, what if pathology isn't all inside us? What if it is also between us? And thus, reactivity. Thus, what's clinically called chronic anxiety. Bowen uh, was one of the first to suggest that there's a form of anxiety called chronic anxiety that acts like acute anxiety. It's sneaky. It's deceiving. It makes you think you're in trouble when you're not. It makes you think you're in danger when you're not. So he did what's known as the eight concepts of Bowen theory. I'm sure in a future Being Human podcast, we'll go through all eight. By the way, when I was a chaplain, the head chaplain at UT Hospital, George, trained under Murray Bowen. Uh, he was one of Bowen's early students. And so then, this is 1996, I show up as this green Bible college student at this hospital to be a chaplain, and George teaches us Bowen theory or systems theory. You know, it doesn't take much imagination to think about how helpful that theory was to an anxious young chaplain. The simple idea, as I learned the theory and the different tenets of the theory, that the best way to help others was to manage myself. The best way to help others was not to catch all the anxiety and anxiously go in, but actually be aware of my anxiety, be aware of the anxiety coming at me. And Bowen theory or systems theory was really what helped me do it. So uh, one of Bowen's very simple concepts is we are all connected, we all infect each other, we are all infected by each other, which would explain why in Bowen's early experiments in the early 60s, as he was getting this theory going, when he would do family therapy, sometimes Bowen wouldn't just bring in mum and dad, he would also bring in siblings. But then uh, as I was reading some of Bowen's early work, sometimes he would bring in cousins, aunts, uncles, and grandparents. He would have like 20 or 30 people in the therapy office all working together because of this one schizophrenic child. Now, whether you think that's a good idea or not, as is the nature of new theories and new experiments, sometimes we swing the pendulum too far. But I do love what Bowen was trying to get to the end of here. What Bowen was trying to figure out is how much are we shaped and infected by our extended family? Uh, and so one of the more famous tools in Bowen theory or systems theory is what's called a genogram. Now, many people have heard of the Enneagram. It has nothing to do with that. A genogram is actually a family tree that you sketch out, but it's not so much interested in cool history. What a genogram is looking at is the relational dynamics between your family and also the generational patterns from generation to generation. In fact, one of Bowen's students, Ed Friedman, his first real book on systems theory was called Generation to Generation. And he wrote as a rabbi to help rabbis and pastors navigate the way their churches are like a family, the way we all kind of act like a family over time. The reason it's called systems theory is because any group of people who are in relationship in an ongoing way become a system in this theory. And that gets interesting because we start behaving in certain predictable ways. And so most famously, family systems theory. 
But many of us, I'm one of these people, we've simply lifted systems theory off the therapy couch and we've put it in two really interesting places. In the church, how does a church operate like a family? How does a group of people, a large group of people in a church, have predictable patterns and dynamics, right? Uh, But also uh, a lot of the work I do is in organizations. So I'll go into a company or a nonprofit or a church staff and I'll work with that team because they are a system. A sporting team is a system. Any group of people that spend time together. So when I was a chaplain, there were six chaplain residents and two supervisors and we formed a system. Now, where that gets interesting is Bowen teaches you to notice you know, who, I mean, I'm, this is my language, but I kind of got it from Bone, who's getting reactive in a big way, who's getting reactive in a small way. Maybe the simplest way to notice that is whatever group of people you want to look at, have you ever noticed that you all kind of fall into predictable behavior? So that's Bowen's idea. We're all connected. Therefore, we all infect each other and are infected by each other. Therefore, If you as an individual can regulate your own emotional health, you can help others. Later on, flight attendants came along and they said, first put the oxygen mask on your own face. Bowen was radical back in the 50s and 60s, suggesting that the best thing you can offer your system or your people is working on your own emotional maturity. Uh, And then he then, his most famous concept is what's known as differentiation of self. I have a whole chapter on differentiation of self in my book, Managing Leadership Anxiety. Now, what I love about systems theory is that was a long time ago, right? The 1960s, it's been kicked around and iterated in academia and in therapy clinics all around the world. Uh, And so there are more than just streams of Murray Bowen Uh, Gregory Bateson would be another famous systems theorist. What's most interesting to me about Bateson and his successors, the people who formed the Mental Research Institute, is the way they discovered they stumbled upon this thing called attempted solutions. If every group of people or every system gets stuck, then one of the reasons we get stuck is because of our attempted solution to that problem. Think about it this way. Every human being has problems. It's just normal. We all have problems and we are able to resolve some or most of our problems, but there's a certain kind of problem that gets really tricky, an entrenched problem, a recurring problem. And that is often the case because our attempted solution to that problem keeps the problem going. In my book, I famously write about one of my boys who came home from basketball practice complaining. This is when he was in middle school. Uh, For those in the global audience, he was in like seventh grade, year seven. And he came home from school complaining. He's like, dad, William is a ball hog. William's not passing the ball. So, okay, in system theory, William's not passing the ball. That's the problem, right? And then I said to my son, what do you do about that? When William doesn't pass the ball, what do you do about it? And my son said, well, if William's not passing the ball to me, I'm not going to pass the ball to William. Okay, look, this kid was like 12 or 13, so I don't hold this against him at all. And again, I used, with his permission, I use this example in my book. But even if you've never heard of system theory, and even if you're trying to get your mind around attempted solutions, you hear that story and you know my son's solution is not only not going to work, it's going to make it worse, isn't it? And sure enough, we would go to a basketball game and there's five kids on the court and three are playing basketball, and my son and William are playing a whole different game. They're playing keep away. Uh, Their game is don't let the other have the ball. And so the more that my son withholds the ball from William, the more William withholds the ball from my son because we're all kind of driven by ego, both boys going home to their parents complaining that the other boy is a ball hog. That's what's known as a stuck problem, a stuck problem pattern. Now, the two clearest signs of attempted solutions are any time that you are applying more of the same or try harder to something that isn't working. That's like, that's like the hallmark sign that you're stuck in a problem 
when your solution is more of the same of something that isn't working or try harder with something that isn't working. When I learned about attempted solutions, more of the same try harder stuck patterns, that really lit me up as a pastor. You know, in the last episode, I talked about what lit me up as a pastor in this theory was the idea that chronic anxiety or reactivity is built on something false. And yet my faith is built on something true that sets me free. And so something false keeps me bound, something true sets me free. And as a pastor, I had these bells ringing in my head. I thought, wow, this is helpful for people in their faith. This is helpful in my own faith. And then when I studied Bateson and his crew, the Mental Research Institute, I mean, it wasn't just helpful in my leadership. When I started to notice these patterns in me, when I'm getting stuck, when I started to notice patterns in my team, my congregation, but also in my faith. When you ever think about your faith, so much of our faith is spinning with no progress. Why? Because we are applying very well-meaning attempted solutions to something that isn't working. Maybe the simplest example would be open your Bible, turn to the book of Acts, read what they those early followers did in Acts chapter 2. Now be more like those people. And when you fall short, try harder to be more like those people. Do more of the same to be more like those people. Another simple way to look at an attempted solution is uh, pray to God, nothing much happening. Try harder to pray to God nothing much happening, do more of the same. And so what I see as a pastor, I see so many well-meaning people putting all of this energy, because listen, we all want to follow Christ well. No, I mean, I don't mean we, we want to be selfish. We want to really follow Christ in a way that honors our Savior. I see so many well-meaning people on a treadmill in their faith of more of the same and try harder. And so I just think there's a more, better, fruitful way. I think that more of the same try harder, we end up trying to be something other than human-sized. We're trying to be a super Christian or, I mean, here's another example, and I'll be getting into this uh, later in the year, April, May, I'll be talking more about this. How many times do you read your Bible and you expect yourself to be more like the person you're reading about? So one week, maybe you're reading about Peter walking on water. And you say, you know what, I really should take more courageous steps of faith. But then the next week, you're reading about Mary who sits at Jesus' feet, contemplative, and you think to yourself, "Ah, I'm always in a hurry. I'm too much in a hurry. I really should slow down and contemplate more. That would be a simple example of trying to be more than God called you to be. Because first of all, a couple of things, Peter only walked on water once but we feel this constant low-grade pressure to always be walking by faith. Peter was nothing like Mary. They're very different people. Peter was bold and courageous and impetuous. Mary, we don't know much about Mary, but she was probably contemplative and thoughtful. They probably weren't much like each other. And yet you and I, by the way we read our scripture, we expect to be the best of both of them. I'm just talking about Peter and Mary What about Paul and Moses and Ruth and Esther? And so over the time as a Christian, we already feel like we're falling short. We already feel like we're not very good at this. And now we have stacked like a fictional super disciple that none of us will ever be, that God is not calling us to be, and yet we are trying harder and doing more of the same on this faith treadmill that is wearing us out. I simply think there's a better, more fruitful way. And that's what I introduced in the last episode. Instead of that, what if we got off the treadmill of all that effort and energy and instead did, I think, what's the more difficult work of looking at our core beliefs? What is it that I depend on when I'm not depending on Jesus? And how can I die to that so that I can be more made into God's image. Uh, The core beliefs that infect and block our precious beliefs. So as a general rule in this podcast, when we talk about core beliefs, whether it's me or my wife Lisa and I or Jimmy or even our guests, what we're getting at is the story I tell myself. That's kind of the common language for this, the story I tell myself. 
In the Catholic Church, they might call it the false self. You may have heard of that language, the false self. Um, Enneagram uses some of that language too. But essentially, you l- listen, we're using different words to describe the same thing. It's what I depend on when I'm not depending on Jesus. It's uh, what I depend on to be well. And what we discover is oftentimes we need things to be a certain way for us to be well. So, you know, the story I tell myself, for example, is everyone who ever meets me must like me. And so when someone doesn't like me or is disappointed in me, the alarm bells go off. I've, I've kind of covered that before. So what I want to do today uh, as we kind of come to a close here is I actually want to introduce um, something that's hmm, it's simple but difficult. So it's not complicated, it's simple, but it's not easy, it's difficult. I, I want to just open us up to looking at the nature of every belief um, and the nature of every belief. Every belief kind of operates the same way. And if you can learn that, then you can learn to measure your beliefs. It's really powerful. So I'm going to exchange a couple of words, the nature of every belief, or I could just as easily say the nature of every gospel. Because what's fascinating about the word gospel is before it was a church word, it was a Roman Empire word. You know, obviously the New Testament is set in the Roman Empire and the Roman Empire had a gospel and they called it a gospel. Uh, It was the Pax Romana, the Pax Romana. There's a wonderful historian named Tom Holland, not to be confused with Spider-Man, although maybe he is actually Spider-Man. He's never denied it. But still, this historian named Tom Holland, he's actually got a book coming out any day now called Pax. And it's actually from a historian's point of view, he's examining this propaganda of Rome, this gospel of Rome. Gospel means good news. And so Rome basically said the good news of Rome is that you can have peace. Now, in case you're wondering If you're an everyday human in the Roman Empire, here's what you have to do to get peace. Number one, you have to let Rome conquer your village. You have to, like if you're in Jerusalem or something or Galilee or wherever you are, you have to let Roman centurions come into your village and conquer it. That means that they're probably going to kill or at least enslave a number of your men, maybe some of your women, some of your kids, having conquered your village you then have to let them throw a party through your village, through the main street of your village, what's known as a triumphal procession. Now, those of you Bible nerds, that might be ringing some bells because the Apostle Paul in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I think it is, talks about a triumphal procession. Rome, once they've conquered your village, all of their centurions and the most powerful general or whoever would be at the front of the procession in their huge horses and their armor and their plate and everything, the might of the Roman Empire on display. And then in the back of the procession are your husbands and brothers and sons in chains being dragged through your village because they're going to be killed or crucified. They're going to be enslaved or, you know, later on put in the, um, um, oh my goodness, I've forgotten the name of it, the gladiator games uh, for entertainment. And if you let them do that, and then if you let them install a puppet king like Herod or even a prefect like Pontius Pilate to represent the might of Rome as kind of a threat, like, you know, if you go sideways, we're going to crucify you. So they put in a prefect like Pontius Pilate, and then they tax you to the hilt. And if you, as a peasant farmer, can't pay your taxes, that's fine. They'll bring a tax collector with a Roman centurion to your door And they'll shake you down for taxes. They'll take some of your houseware or what was often the case is they'll take and steal one of your children and enslave your child for tax. Now, if you let Rome do that, you can have the peace of Rome. You can have the roads and the aqueducts and the safety and all of that that goes with it. But my goodness, what a cost. What a terrible cost. There's a New Testament scholar named Justin Maggot and he specializes in Corinth. That's kind of his field. He's got commentaries on Corinthians. And he says in Corinth, at least 95 to 97% of the population lived a subsistence living, like hand to mouth every day, trying to find enough food for the next day. Three to 5% of the Corinthian region were well-to-do, well-off. So the way I think about that is in the Pax Romana, in the promise and gospel of Rome, um, 
the majority paid, the minority benefited. A couple of other interesting things about uh, the Pax Romana, the Gospel of Rome. Of course, we have Caesar Augustus. He was the Caesar of Rome when Jesus was born. His dad, Julius Caesar, had died. And one of Augustus's first acts as Caesar was to declare his daddy a god, which then makes Caesar Augustus the son of God. Uh, Augustus had a, um, a poet named Virgil. You can actually Google Virgil the poet from the Roman Empire. And Virgil would follow Augustus around and write this wonderful poetry about Augustus. It reminds me of um, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, Patsy uh, with the coconuts following around brave Sir Robin singing songs about him. That's kind of what Virgil did for Augustus. But if you Google, Google Virgil's poetry, you will see that he actually declares the peace of Rome and I'm going to paraphrase it, but he basically says the day of Augustus's birth is a day of glad tidings and great joy for all mankind. Through the birth of Augustus comes peace for the world. I mean, man, if that's not ringing Christmas bells for you. And so Caesar is Lord was the most common declaration of faith in the early Roman Empire. And so now we get Luke and Paul and these New Testament writers with so much moxie saying that Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Jesus is the son of God, not Caesar. Stunning. It's absolutely stunning. And they created a different gospel, a gospel that is the idea that you don't have to sacrifice for the God. You don't have to pay and have your children enslaved for the sake of the God. The God sacrifices for you. So my point is that Jesus has a gospel. The Roman Empire has a gospel here in the United States. You could say that the American dream is a form of a gospel. When I grew up in Australia as a teenager who felt very lost, I was living for a, a teenage gospel. And every gospel has three elements to it. Every gospel puts you on a path. It says, do these things. It puts you on a path. It dangles a promise at the end of the path. If you do these things, you will get this thing. And then somebody pays. So every gospel has a path, a promise, and a payment. I'm so sorry that it's alliterated like we're in 1990s preaching again. You remember that when we all alliterated our sermons in the 90s? Some of you preachers who are watching or listening, you're like, oh, I, I still alliterate. Yeah, that's fine. But every gospel has a path, a promise, and a payment. So the Roman Empire, that was the path. Let us conquer you. Let us tax you. Let us steal your children. That's the path. The promise was peace. But for most of the people in the Roman Empire, the peace, they never got the promise. And they paid. They paid. And the god, Caesar and his cronies, they got the benefit. The American dream, in many ways, in the 2020s, here we are, those of us in the United States, and we are still grappling with the path. And does everyone get the promise? And we're grappling with who has paid historically, so those of us get the benefit. If we look at my life as a teenager in the 1980s, what was the path for a secular teenager in Australia in the 1980s? It was pretty simple. It was make a girl laugh, get good grades, be good at sports. Now, you didn't have to have all three. In the words of the late great Meatloaf, two out of three ain't bad. Make a girl laugh was pretty important. And then you could either be good at, at academics or good at sports. Uh, that was the path. And then the promise for the teenager, at least for me, uh, you belong. You fit in. You're one of us. You're okay. And uh, as I take stock of my own efforts in the teenage gospel, I was zero for three. I got so embarrassed around girls when I was a teenager. I just got so anxious and I'd end up tripping over myself. I wasn't very good at sports. I wasn't very good at academics. And boy, did I pay. I would go home a tortured soul. Am I ever going to fit in? Is anyone ever going to like me? I just felt so incompetent as a teenager. So that's the Australian teenage gospel. The reason I took us down this kind of gospel path is reactivity, chronic anxiety, is and has a gospel. Uh, for example, for me, the gospel message is worry your way to peace. Worry is the path. Peace is the promise. I pay, I never get the promise. Uh, chronic anxiety says to me, you have to do what other people want so they'll like you. Path, promise, payment. For those of you who are perfectionists, 
Never make a mistake so you can rest. So you can start actually thinking about your core beliefs. And actually, I've done this where I write them down. You can map them out under this path promise payment. What's fascinating is every gospel ever, whether we're talking religious gospels like the Roman Empire, uh, even modern religions like Islam, the human always does the paying. The God always gets the benefit, except one gospel Jesus of Nazareth. What's distinct? Like, you know, today it's not cool to say that, uh, you know, Christianity is unique, but it is. It's the only religion that teaches that the God pays and the human benefits. Every other religion teaches that the human pays and the God benefits. Now, that's not original with me. The late, great Dr. Tim Keller really did a lot of work in that field, and I'm indebted to him for some of these ideas that I've been working on. But what I find liberating as I integrate my knowledge of the gospel with my knowledge of reactivity is I can start to notice what path am I on? Is it giving me the promise who's paying? Because when I relax into God's presence, he has already paid and my identity is secure. When I'm anxious or when I'm reactive, I'm paying and paying and paying but I'm never getting the promise. Those of you who are perfectionists, you've probably never done it perfectly. I've never been able to please all the people I want. Those of you who are control freaks, you've never been able to control as much as you want. It's a a carrot forever out of reach. We never get it. This is why as a pastor, I'm so passionate about you and I being human-sized because when we're human-sized, we're no longer on that treadmill to nowhere. We're no longer exerting all of that energy. For many of us, energy that we exert in the name of Jesus, our our faith energy exerted in the name of Jesus to try to get this thing that we can't ever get instead of relaxing into the presence of God. Now, we're four episodes in here and we're actually just about to wrap up. I've got a, a wonderful quote I'm excited to share with us before we wrap up, but we're four episodes in and particularly for those of you who are newer to me, you're like, where did this guy come from? Like, what's going on here? I get it. Um, you might be quite alarmed that I'm always sounding like I'm looking at us being lazy Christians. Like, man, if I followed Steve's advice, I, I would end up lazily in a hot tub relaxing while the world burns. No, the opposite is true. The vision for this kind of living is not laziness, it's freedom. It's freedom. We are free to give our life away, to sacrifice ourselves, to even put ourselves in tremendous danger. I would say the Apostle Paul in many ways is the example of the thing I'm, I'm teaching. I've had a few people when they hear me talk about this, they say to me, Steve, it sounds like you're letting us off the hook. To which I just simply want to ask, what hook are you on? Like what kind of God would put you on a hook. No, no, the God we believe in put himself on a literal hook. He's the one that paid. We get the benefit. So we'll get to a quote here in a bit, but just the simple question, this is deeper work, this is foundational work, so this is not work that ends with this episode. It kind of imbues this whole ethos of being human. You can start to analyze your beliefs What am I living for? What path am I on? Am I getting, is it good for its word? Am I getting the promise or is it deceiving me? In what ways am I paying? And then what's the gospel of Jesus? How can I relax into it? Today's quote, it's kind of a long one, uh, is by the Catholic priest Herbert McCabe. Herbert McCabe is pretty obscure. He's not very well known. He passed away maybe 20 years ago. But when I read this, it it has forever changed changed my life. I'll I'll say that. It was profound to me. And uh, I'll I'll give you McCabe's idea to get kind of a lodge in our brain, and then I'll read us his quote. McCabe's idea is that the problem with humans is that sin doesn't change God's view of us. McCabe is making the case that sin changes our view of God's view of us. Sin, if you will, infects and distorts the way we think God sees us. All right, that's the idea. Here's the quote. 
Look at the parable of the prodigal son. The younger son takes his inheritance and squanders it in a far country. Eventually, he finds himself impoverished and hungry and in despair. He acknowledges how his sin has altered his relationship to his father. He says, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. But what precisely has changed? Has the father ceased to love his son? Has he become the angry patriarch the son now fears him to be? On the contrary, the father has been waiting for his son to return and upon seeing him in the distance, he jubilantly rushes to greet and welcome him home. No, McCabe writes, what has changed is the son. Because of his sin, the prodigal is no longer capable of seeing the father as he really is. Sin is something that changes God into a projection of our guilt so that we don't see the real God at all. All we see is some kind of a judge. God has become a condemnation of us. In our minds, God has been turned into Satan, the accuser of man, the paymaster, the one who weighs our deeds and condemns us. The father does not need to be persuaded to forgive and welcome his son. He does not need to change his mind. He loves his son. That is truth. All the son needs to do is to see his sin for what it is. He recognizes himself as a sinner, and at that moment he ceases to be one. His contrition is forgiveness. All the rest is celebration and feasting. God doesn't change his mind about us. God changes our mind about him. Again, and again, and again. Oh, that'll do. See you next week.